Uh, very nice to be back here with an all access. And uh, I'm here today with a slightly different audio visual setup. And uh, I hope the sound is much better. And, um, and I'm wearing a shirt today because I just came back from a uh, discussion on financial stability and blockchains hosted by the Cleveland Fed. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, so uh, it was a lot of fun. And uh, for those of you who missed it, I'll give you a very, very brief uh, redux of uh, what we discussed. Um, but uh, once again, I think this is the fourth time I'm holding this uh, all access, or maybe the third time I'm doing this all access show. I'm having a lot of fun. I hope you guys are too. And uh, I've been getting a lot of good feedback from the community about these discussions. And um, uh, and it's great to hear that people are getting something out of them, uh, getting a glimpse into 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 a researcher's mind, perhaps into uh, uh, into sort of the concerns of somebody who's active in the field, who's building, I think, one of the most you know, the most innovative blockchain in the space. Um, going forward, I plan to bring guests on occasion. So we're going to start doing some Zoom calls with people I look up to or people uh, who have a unique perspective. I hope you'll enjoy those as well. And uh, as always, we'll talk about what's what's exciting, what's what's uh, what's new in the industry, and new developments for the Avalanche Network. So uh, let's jump into it for this week. Um, the uh, let me first start sharing this, so there's something else to look at uh, besides me. Um, so uh, I think hopefully this will work. There we go. And um, so. I hope I hope you can see my screen. Uh, let's see. So um, I was just at uh, a, a panel uh, that lasted an hour on financial in, financial stability and and uh, well generally on financial stability. Um, and my role on it was to talk about the blockchain perspective. And um, in a in a nutshell, my position is of course that blockchains will revolutionize the way we do finance. Not only will they revolutionize the back office the way we send money, the way we send assets, the way we keep track of assets. We're not going to be doing that on COBOL-based systems anymore. This is somehow kind of revolutionary when you say it to a Wall Street person. And um, uh, and, and the moment they hear it, it's actually, it actually comes as a relief. It's like telling somebody who's terminally ill, like, you know, hey, you have this disease, it's going to happen. Well, you know, they realize that what they have is a, is a pretty bad infrastructure. And uh, they welcome anything and everything that will make capital flows more efficient. So uh, it's happening. It's unstoppable. But more to the point, um, on top of the back office, the blockchain revolution comes with an entirely new approach to things that affect the front of every business. It changes the way we do business overall, and it enables new ways of, uh, of carrying out financial uh, transactions. So... It's not just sending assets, et cetera. It is also building new kinds of financial products. It's encoding business processes in the form of smart contracts. It's providing new kinds of trans uh, transparency. And it also changes what uh, many people in the government do. Uh, they are used to doing post hoc uh, enforcement. They're doing they're very used to doing investigations. They're used to forensics. They are used to going into big companies and looking at all the books and trying to find uh, traces of malfeasance. And of course, every now and then they find something. Uh, in fact, quite regularly they find something, and um, and then quite uh, uh, quite you know uncommonly. Um, uh, no, no, I, but I don't mean to say it that way. Um, uh, in, in much much less rare than you would think is the case where they find some really big scandal. Every half a half a decade, there's typically a big big scandal on Wall Street. So um, uh, so blockchains will completely eradicate the way we do uh, inspection compliance. And instead of doing this post hoc, you know, spot checks, instead of trying to sort of you know occasionally go in with a microscope to try to piece pieces together, we will instead be building systems that are built from the ground up to be compliant. They will not be able to misbehave. You can rule out the behaviors that you don't want and become, you can build the compliance rules into the fabric of this new financial infrastructure. So governments welcome this. And my interaction I think there was, was indeed one that was very positive and that mirrors every other interaction I've had with regulators. So. Uh, they welcome the blockchain revolution. It, unlike what the Bitcoin maxis think, it is not government versus us. So government is us. 
and um, what they're trying to do is uh, is try to do do enforcement in a very imperfect world. And what we bring to them is a new infrastructure that can completely revolutionize the way they work. So that's that's going to be really exciting. Um, at the same time, blockchains take away some of their tools. So one of the main things they take away are capital controls. We've already seen this in Venezuela. We've already seen this in many other parts of the world uh, where uh, blockchains were banned for a while, Russia, Ukraine, um, where uh, you know Lebanon recently saw a financial uh, financial uh, catastrophe, and we saw the the the, the impact on uh, on the crypto scene. So um, very very interesting set of developments to follow. And DeFi itself brings with it all sorts of risks, but also all sorts of opportunities. From the point of view of somebody who's interested in financial stability, is this whole question of is what I've got, this global thing that I've got, something that's robust, that's able to withstand risks, uh, or is it a, a house of cards ready to topple over, kind of like the economy in 2007? And that's a very hard question to answer. And uh, since the 2007 crisis, uh, the regulators have, have been trying to answer this with imperfect tools. They don't have the econometric tools to be able to tell, okay, well, this is what happens when I inject this kind of, a, kind of a, a shock to the system. This is what happens when I give this kind of a stimulus to these kinds of behaviors. These are impossible, essentially, to simulate with the, or, or to, to, uh, to peer into with the, the regular economy we have. And um, they're not super easy with blockchains either, but blockchains and the transparency they provide, the encoding of the interdependencies that they, they surface makes it a lot easier to, uh, to foresee how certain shocks might affect things. And uh, I'm not saying that the new future that we build is going to be more robust. I don't think that we're doing things in the blockchain space that will lead to robustness, not yet. It's just kind of evolving as people provide incentive programs, as DeFi applications couple with each other. We're building a behemoth that's quite complicated, um, but certainly nowhere near as complicated as the system we've got in the, in, on Wall Street. And uh, uh, But what do we do also have is transparency. And what we also have our, in our arsenal are tools from program verification, tools from program analysis that we could bring to bear on financial problems. And we can do data collection and data analysis on blockchains that we could not do before, that, that normal economists don't have access to. So that's a fascinating, fascinating space. The very first econometric papers started appearing maybe six, seven years ago uh, in the blockchain space. And, um, and that, that trend will continue. And we'll be able to answer some of these kinds of uh, questions relating to financial stability. Um, again, at the panel, questions surfaced about all sorts of interesting issues. Um, trustworthiness of stable coins and the risks they pose. This is an issue for people who believe in blockchains as well as, as people who don't. Um, these are, by the way, called no-coiners. And uh, the term no-coiner was coined for me, by the way. If you go to Urban Dictionary, you will find the very first definition. That's how it was coined. There's an example there. And uh, my name is mentioned and uh, they're just uh, cursing me, et cetera. I was critical of something in Bitcoin at the time and uh, people were trying to make fun of me, trying to call me a no-coiner. And um, it was kind of funny. Um, I've seen the word no-coiner on Times Square. Uh, a company bought, uh, bought some ads saying, don't be a no-coiner. That kind of hit home, you know, I was like, hey, that, that, that word, that, that was for me. You don't get to use it in your ad. And, um, and then the funny thing is, um, of all the institutions, that work in the blockchain space. Mine, the Cornell Blockchain Club, was the very first one to open, to ring the NASDAQ bell. And it was the very first one to appear at on Times Square where the word no coiner appeared without having to pay for it. So it's a really funny world. And uh, look where we are now. And I think the people who, uh, who were trying to call me no coiner and who were trying to denigrate me, the Bitcoin maxis, um, you know, um, I don't know what to say to you except have fun staying poor. Um, anyhow, so moving forward, the um, uh, the the one one thing that no coiners and 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 blockchain people can agree on is the risk that stable coins pose to uh, to uh, to the space overall. Now I try to delineate for them the different risks. Um, the uh, stable coins that are issued by a counterparty, the fiat-backed ones, 
they, they need to be regulated in some fashion because there are concerns about the counterparty risk. There are legitimate concerns and they are self-regulating already. I've had extensive interactions with, uh, with the Tether folks, for example, and uh, fantastic people, by the way. Uh, Paolo is a fantastic technologist. And um, uh, the, uh, you know, so that's, that's, a, that's a risk. And, um, and, and the failure of the counterparty in a, in a fiat-backed stablecoin scenario represents a risk for us all. Um, at the same time, there are risks with uh, other instruments as well. Algorithmic stablecoins are interesting. Um, to date, one of the main issues I have is that to date, none of them, none of the algorithmic stablecoins come with a proof of stability. They rely on complex game theoretic mechanisms for their correctness. And um, no one has done a, um, a good study or a good, uh, good, uh, good analysis for why they should remain um, and, and remain stable under a, a big, big demand shock. That is to say, when all the asset prices are dropping, there's, there's no reason why these things should, uh, uh, should retain their value. And now, um, empirically, some do. And so the question is, what do those things do? What do they have that others don't? We've seen others fail. So as a scientist, I think we need to explore this angle and we need to look into, uh, you know, are there proofs to be had here? Can we build better systems and so on? And uh, I've stayed personally away from uh, algorithmic stable coins, but I've watched them very closely. I also wrote, I think, the very first uh, taxonomy of stable coins a, a while ago with, uh, uh, with Kevin Sekniki and uh, Amani Moin. So it's an exciting uh, space. Um, uh, let's see, regulators and people interested in that space, financial stability, uh, also worry about other things, as you might imagine, not just blockchains. In fact, blockchains for them are a rounding error, right? So if you look at the size of the American economy and, um, and, and, and the total market cap of, of cryptocurrency, it's just tiny for them. They have far bigger things to worry about. One of those things that really poses a huge problem for financial stability is climate change. And so part of the panel was, was spent uh, on discussing climate change and its impact on all of our lives. And, um, and one of the interesting things that came out was, of course, the intersection of cryptocurrencies and climate change. Isn't it? So the question to me was, um, aren't you concerned that proof of work mining is incredibly consumptive of energy, is warming up the environment? And, uh, and you know, so that's a big concern. It is. It is. It cannot be something that we ignore. Um, if our prime directive here is to leave the planet in a better, better fashion than we found it to our to our descendants, and uh, so uh, so there, I think uh, the people who are using these proof of work coins will tell you, oh, you know, some of the the energy is coming from renewable sources. Okay, it is, but it's displacing better uses for society, and that's one of the common criticisms. You could be doing anything else with that energy uh, to achieve a requisite level of, of decentralization. And uh, overall, 10 years ago, in fact, five years ago, I had a different answer. My answer was, yes, I hear you. I am very concerned about environmental issues, but I don't know how to build a, um, a decentralized Byzantine fault tolerance system that achieves great decentralization without the use of these technologies. And uh, the things that came before them, they didn't scale what didn't scale, all of the classical consensus protocols, the ones that power, say, Polkadot, et cetera, the ones that power, um, you know, uh, Diem, the, whatever it, it's called today. Every day they change the name because uh, they have a terrible t reputation. And uh, so Facebook's Libra became Diem, and now I think it has pivoted once more uh, to a different name. All of those coins um, are, are limited. And so their primary value proposition is, let's swipe the, the, the slate clean. Okay, that's fine. Let's change our financial infrastructure. I can get down with that. Um, but then they say, and instead, let's institute Mark Zuckerberg as chief and his 98, 99 best friends. So that, that's a no-go from me. And uh, you know these protocols nece uh, are necessarily limited in the number of participants per round if, because they end up requiring something close to N squared data flow. They don't maybe necessarily require n squared packets, but the amount of information that has to flow is n squared. And so that does not scale well. They are limited to small instances. 
Instead, um, luckily, I think today uh, we're in a much better situation. Oh, sorry, I should have I should mention. So that's that's those are classical protocols. Nakamoto consensus is fine. It's it was until five years ago the best way to get decentralization, the best way to get thousands of miners participating in the construction of a blockchain. So it's and it's very very robust, unlike classical protocols. So that those are all great. That's that I didn't know how else to achieve that, but uh, but today we have better technologies, and by that I'm referring to the avalanche consensus protocol, which gives us the ability to absorb millions of participants as first hand participants in the consensus process. And um, no other protocol has that. That's why I got so excited about avalanche, that's why I uh, decided to work full time on avalanche, that's why I'm pouring my 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 all my effort into making avalanche a big success. Um, the, uh, there are other concerns, of course. So, um, you know, proof of work, uh, has, a, has, is, has actually become so big that it has a centralization force built into it. You and I cannot participate meaningfully in Bitcoin. We're too small. And, uh, the bigger you are, the richer you get, the more rewards you get, the bigger a miner you are, the more the, the bigness rewards you. And that creates a rich get richer phenomena for proof of work. It's kind of funny how proof of work, you know, Bitcoin maxis typically throw this allegation at uh, proof of stake people, but it turns out it's the other way around. When you have economies of scale going for you, then uh, the fact that you're a big miner means that you find more blocks. The fact that you're building on your own blocks means that you're more likely to find the next block ahead of other people who are competing with you who might even be the same size as you. So this leaves us in a funny situation where uh, these uh, these mining pools tend to be big and uh, they tend to conglomerate. And that leads to uh, to the current situation where only a, a few dozen uh, miners are the ones that end up um, uh, building these uh, these blockchains. Now, if all I had to do was incorporate a dozen participants, then there are many, many protocols one could use and one could have used a very simple protocol from 1980 something, 1987 uh, to, to, to do what, uh, you know, to, to get the same result. So, um, but luckily, all of these old technologies are being pushed aside. Luckily, we have a much better foundation now for building really large consensus groups. And uh, on top of that, we built the Avalanche architecture with networks and subnetworks. Uh, to be able to accommodate and take advantage of, of this decentralization in the best way possible. So um, this is all exciting. I also told the Fed about, um, about uh, uh, well, they were talking about cyber risks. They're very concerned, as they should be, uh, about a, a computer hacking episode or a or ransomware or some, some, some kind of a, an, an attack, a cyber attack, taking over large swaths of financial infrastructure. That's a huge problem. You could take down a whole nation, you could take down a whole globe uh, if you're not careful. And uh, these are real big issues. And um, one thing that's apparent though, is that when, when government people think about cyber attacks, they are typically thinking of cyber attacks in the context of a singular institution, of a monoculture. And uh, my role on the panel here was to remind them that Yes, they, that's right. That's the default state of affairs. Until recently, you know, we have the world, which was consisting of enclaves of, of, of companies um, that run their own monoculture within the company boundaries. And, uh, you know, you have the Facebooks of the world, you have the Amazons of the world, the Googles of the world, and the various different companies of the world. But, um, but now we have blockchains. And the, the key value proposition in a blockchain is that you have these systems that are administered by multiple entities, independent entities, running different code bases, potentially, in different uh, configurations. Therefore, the chances of, you know, at any one time, some of the components that comprise the larger system might, might have failed. But that doesn't matter because the system is built to withstand that. And, uh, and I reminded them that in the decade that's, you know, in the past decade, uh, we've seen failures of Facebook, of Google, of Amazon Web Services. I've seen them firsthand many times. And I have not seen uh, Bitcoin go down. Bitcoin has gone down, um, you know, um, between us, between blockchain people, you know. And then also I could also say the following. Bitcoin is really down for 9.5 minutes in between, uh, in between blocks every 10 minutes. But we're not gonna get into that. Uh, the bottom line is Bitcoin, Bitcoin actually lives to its service guarantee in, incredibly well. 
and uh, we, you know we can we can get nitpicky and criticize how slow it is etc but it does what it purports to do incredibly well and uh, it serves as a store of value incredibly well so uh, so it's uh, it's interesting to point out to them look you've been building these systems that are all based on monocultures and monocultures have these risks so you should really be thinking of systems built on the Byzantine Fault Tolerant Foundation. Anyway, I had a great fun. I had a great time just chatting with them about uh, an hour and a half ago. Um, I'm not sure if they recorded it. I'm not sure if it's going to be accessible. But it was open and free access at the time it was happening. And um, if you're interested and they made it available, feel free to check it out. It was kind of fun to, to have that discussion. And it's really good to see uh, these technologies gain more acceptance. I also reminded them that they, they, it cannot be stopped. It's just too late for the crypto revolution uh, to be blocked. And, um, and it's, it's a fascinating world that, that follows. It's going to be a much better world that follows. Um, let's see, what else happened this week? Oh, I had a, a long tweet thread about performance metrics. And uh, I got kind of sick and tired of people coming up to me and saying, hey, you know, what's the fastest blockchain? You know, I don't know what the fastest blockchain is, but I do know how to measure it. Um, I actually also know what the fastest blockchain is, but I know how to measure these things. And most people don't. And because most people don't know how to measure them, some shysters have been taking advantage of them. They, they feed them wrong information. They feed them fraudulent data. And, um, uh, and or, you know, then there are other people who are building large systems that are worth multiple billions of dollars, and yet they don't know how to measure the most basic things about distributed systems. So to fight this, I wrote a very long thread on, uh, on how to measure the performance of uh, distributed systems. And uh, I'm not sure if... Um, I'm not sure what you guys are seeing because I'm just, oh yeah, good. Yes, you're seeing something, uh, well, that was cool. You're seeing infinity right here. Um, so I wrote this thread on, uh, on how to measure the performance of, um, of distributed systems. And uh, so um, one of the most important metrics that people care about is speed. What's the fastest blockchain? And uh, when people hear this, the main main metric, the main main thing that they want to measure, the main thing that they're familiar with is transactions per second. And they think that equates to speed. Transactions per second does not measure speed. This is a little hard to stomach at first, but bear with me. TPS is a measure of, a, of the ability of a system to complete work per second, okay? So, uh, it is a measure of capacity of the system, not speed. It's the rate at which you could, uh, you could clear that many transactions. It is not a measure of how long those transactions take. And I have this nice animation for you here. Take this factory. This factory is probably capable of, uh, it looks like it's finishing about one car, one car per second. I would say maybe like 0.8 cars per second. So that's fantastic. It's very, very fast because these, these cars are rolling off, the, uh, uh, rolling off the assembly line. Now, many people think you could just invert this, right? So if I'm, let's say, just one, one car per second. So because my factory is doing one car per second, is my, is my factory completing a car in a second? So now, okay, don't get caught up in the English. It is completing a car every second. But the, the process of constructing a car obviously takes far more than a second. It takes, in the case of Tesla, it takes many, many months. You start with raw materials, and there's a whole lot of processes that go into concurrently building uh, many, many, many cars at the same time. And these things start rolling off the end um, at, at the rate of, let's say, one car per second. So you can see that a factory can be producing one car per second while it takes many months to build any given individual car. As a user, you care about your car. You don't give a damn about the, the total capacity. I mean, you do. Okay, so let's be fair. And I try to be fair in this thread. So, you know, um, the, the, uh, the, the transactions per second, it's important. Why is it important? Well, um, you know, there are multiple reasons. The, uh, the higher the capacity is, well, then more people you could accommodate. It scales better to more people. That's good. That's not bad. Um, the higher the capacity is, um, you know, a system like Avalanche that burns fees will burn more fees. 
So more revenue comes into the system, so to speak, and uh, the value of all the coins goes up faster because we're burning far more per second. And speaking of which, as of today, Avalanche, uh, as of yesterday rather, Avalanche was the number three coin in terms of fees spent, and all of the Avalanche fees were burnt. So uh, we were behind Ethereum, Binance Smart Chain, then Avalanche. Number four was Bitcoin. And um, this, uh, you know, the, the, the fees burned, aggregate fees burned, is an indication of the usefulness of a chain. And it's wonderful to be, to be seeing this. I never thought uh, we would be up there. That is just a wonderful, wonderful situation to be in. Um, okay, back to our story here. Capacity is very important. If you are Elon Musk, you care about capacity. If, you, if you're a Tesla stockholder, you care about capacity of Tesla factories. That is absolutely crucial to you. But if you're a user, if you want to buy a Tesla, then you care about how long it takes for them to build your car. And that's what we call time to finality. That's the time from when you, when you place your car order to the time when you get your car back built for you. And as I mentioned, that can be many, many, many months. In the case of Tesla, if you place an order these days, I think they're giving you a date sometime in June is what I hear from friends. So um, just to put this in perspective, you know, again, um, I can build, a, I can make a pizza. So I learned how to cook during the pandemic. I can make a pizza in about half an hour, okay? And I can, I can make, you know, two pizzas uh, an hour. So if, I, if I, someone like me says, I can make two pizzas an hour, you can invert that, right? So you're used to doing that. How much of this can you do? Well, you know, my capacity is two pizzas per hour. And then from that, you can infer that it takes me to, uh, about 30 minutes to make a, meat, a pizza. The reason why you can invert it is because it's not a concurrent process. There's just me in the kitchen. I mix everything. I make the one pizza. I give, put it in the oven. Then I go back to the, to, to the very beginning. I start mixing the dough again, and I make a second pizza, and I put that in the oven, and you know the first operation took 30, 30 minutes, and then the next one took 30 minutes. And uh, this, was, uh, this is kind of like computing something on a single processor, on a uniprocessor. Distributed systems are not, like that's the very definition. They're concurrent systems. They are not uniprocessors. They're not, there is not a singular entity computing something. Instead, uh, the analogy is kind of like, um, like going to Joe's. Joe's in Brooklyn is I think the best pizza in town. It's fantastic. They make thousands of pizzas. And when you order a pizza from Joe's, it takes 30 minutes for them as well. Okay, because that's the latency of making a pizza. The thing that matters from me when I'm making my pizza buying decision, I go to the guy who makes them fastest, okay? So typically. Um, and uh, so, and you can't invert, you know, you can't look at Joe's TP, uh, pizzas per day, invert that and find out how much they make. You know, they probably make thousands of pizzas per hour, but it doesn't take them just a few seconds to make a pizza. Every pizza takes 30 minutes for them. So, uh, so I hope that's clear. I've driven the point home. This is important. There are people who are researchers in this field, in distributed systems, who are reviewing, peer reviewing, and so on, who don't understand these basic mechanisms of, of measurement. And um, I don't know what to say or do, but that's the world we live in. TPS, repeat it with me, TPS is not a measure of speed. Measure of speed is called latency. And the unit of measurement for latency is seconds. How long did your thing take? That's the measurement you want to perform. And you start the timer. When you submit the transaction, you stop it when, it's, when the transaction is complete. That's the only way to measure it. And the, the report must be in seconds. So uh, uh, let's see. So if somebody says, well, we have the fastest chain and then offers you TPS, they're trying to pull a fast one, or they don't know what the heck they're doing. Um, if someone has a packet storm, if every packet is counted as a transaction, they're doing something funny. Uh, it's not even funny, actually. Uh, they're doing something to mislead. Uh, if there's a packet storm, I send you a packet, and then that causes you to send five packets, and there are exponentially many packets flying in your network, your network slows down, etc. then you don't get to boast about your TPS afterwards. That was a packet storm. That wasn't useful transactions completed per second. So there are all sorts of funny things happening in this, in this space. 
Um, so what's really important is latency. And uh, the lower your latencies are, the lower the opportunity for minor extractable value, the better the prices are tracked on, on decentralized exchanges. Imagine a decentralized exchange. Imagine it completing transactions every second. Now compare that with a DEX that's completing transactions in 20 seconds, night and day. So if you're 20 seconds behind NASDAQ, NASDAQ will give you the data from the market 15 seconds delayed for free. They're like, this is worthless data. If you're 15 seconds or more behind the market, you know, there's zero value there. But if you want up to the, uh, you know, up to the minute or whatever, up to the mark, uh, actual fresh financial data, you have to pay a pretty penny to NASDAQ. And the reason for that is it's, it really is crucial to be close to real time. And uh, on that front, I'm really proud of Avalanche. It is by far the fastest chain. I'll show you the measurement that somebody posted down here if I can find it. And uh, oh, um, there is another thing that people do to fool you that has to do with block times. They're like, we're the fastest chain. Our block times are whatever. Well, I can build a chain whose block times are every microsecond. That is not hard. Okay, I don't know why other people don't do that. You could just do it. It's uh, you know you'll fool everybody else. That's that's gullible, and um, but block times only indicate the start of work. So it doesn't matter to me how often you start work. It's just that's immaterial. And um, it's, I'm I'm glad that you have a bus that appears every you know whatever it is every so many seconds. You know every you know, my block time is 0.5 seconds. Nice. Every half a second, uh, there is a bus that shows up. But how long does it get, take to get to your destination? That's the question that everybody needs to be answering. And the fact that you're not even able to comprehend that that's your question at hand tells me a lot about you. So, um, so that's, uh, that's a bit of an issue. And when, when I say you, I'm referring to the people who are pushing these numbers as a, as a measure of their system's performance. So uh, how, how frequently you start work is immaterial. Everybody who procrastinates knows that it doesn't matter how fast you start a new task. It really is the only thing that matters at the end of the day is how often, uh, how, how frequent, how fast you complete those tasks. So um, Avalanche turns out to be a high capacity system. It has high TPS. Avalanche also turns out to be a, uh, a, a very high speed system. It ends up being able to complete transactions very, 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 very fast. And uh, there are other metrics. We'll maybe someday talk about scalability. And I don't want to, want to quite get into it right now because scalability is really a measure of two metrics, one versus another. How does one performance metric behave as you vary another control variable? And um, it ends up faring incredibly well on the front where as you add more nodes into your network, the protocol parameters are mostly unimpacted. And... Um, so I want to show you this measurement that somebody did. And uh, um, actually, maybe they didn't even do measurements. They just collated. Oh, yeah, this was nice. Um, they collated the, the various different, uh, um, uh, the various, various, block, various uh, latencies for different blockchains. And um, I can't find this right now. Yeah, this is not the. This is not showing me what I needed it to show, um, but uh, Avalanche was by far the fastest. So our um, time to, to completion for a transaction is on the order of 0.74 seconds. So that is 740 milliseconds or so. And uh, other chains take on the order of uh, 10 to 20 seconds for the fastest, the ones that are built fastest. So a lot of people think that Solana is super fast. Solana's time to, to, uh, to find finality is on the order of 10 to 20 seconds. Um, Bitcoin is one hour. Uh, that's a legacy system. It's a good benchmark. Ethereum is for equivalent security for as Bitcoin. It's about 37 minutes, I believe. So uh, most people don't wait that long. They, they consider things final earlier. Um, they, they, they end up holding themselves to a slightly lower standard of security than Bitcoin does. So um, actually that's, I mean, and some exchanges don't wait six confirmations either these days. They might actually take it down to three confirmations as well. Okay, so uh, so that's what I think about uh, this little thing, which is my little micro lecture on, on how to measure systems. Don't be fooled by TPS numbers, and um, they're fine. Um, also, one final thing. I see very funny numbers reported for certain chains that, that do multiple things in parallel. Um, 
if you look at their code, at the end of the day, they they have to commit something to their disks. They have to use a database. And that database is a central component, and they're using a stock database. So uh, whatever this, the database bottleneck is, that's their maximum speed. So if you're using RocksDB, then we all know the, 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 the speed of RocksDB. It's a few hundred transactions per second when uh, the database has, has been in use for some time. So um, that's going to be your, your bottleneck limitation. And, um, and uh, Avalanche uh, is building its own database for this very reason. The existing stock databases that everybody uses are incredibly slow because they were not designed with blockchains in mind. And we have a, a new database called Cedrus DB built from the ground up solely for uh, supporting databases. It's not currently in production code yet, but I'm really, really thrilled about when it's going to come in. And uh, so that's my performance rant. Let's move on to other things that happened um, about uh, to other things that happened last week. We announced our partnership with Deloitte. This was a lot of fun. We've been working on this for um, I don't know, two and a half years, maybe two years. Uh, even before we had mainnet, we were talking to Deloitte about about uh, about how to build blockchains together. And uh, the idea here is to combine the speed, resilience, and flexibility of the Avalanche blockchain with Deloitte's enterprise knowledge and uh, to create uh, solutions for uh, disaster recovery. So blockchains, as you know, are incredibly resilient. And uh, one of the things that, well, the, the, one of the things I should, well, maybe I'm leaking alpha, but one of the things we want to do with Deloitte is, is this very project where we are building uh, disaster recovery systems uh, for uh, utilizing the avalanche system. So uh, let's see. Um, there was, uh, oh, okay. Yeah, there was a bit of a, you know, every now and then the, the space gets, takes a step back. And uh, we had a step back when China banned B Bitcoin mining again. And uh, this kind of made me exasperated. You know, China will ban Bitcoin. In fact, even within the last month, I mentioned this. Uh, I, I lost track. By now, I've lost track of how many times China banned Bitcoin mining. Russia will ban and then unban. India will ban and then unban. I think we're good with Korea now. Korea now has good regulations and a fantastically clear set of ground rules. So we're okay on that front. And we were worried about the Korea ban for a while as well. But, uh, but now it's all sorted out over there. But, um, but China, Russia, India expect bans and on bans. I've spoken about this before. The growth curve is up and to the right. So these technologies cannot be stopped. Regulators will at times have very legitimate reasons for wanting to put the brakes on a system. One of the most legitimate reasons for this is often people use cryptocurrencies as a stepping stone into multi-level marketing schemes and pyramid schemes. They collect money using cryptocurrencies from a lot of people and all of those people will end up getting hurt. So not all, but at least half of them will end up getting hurt. So uh, governments that want to, to slow this process down will just wholesale ban crypto for a while and slow it down, but they can't just stop it. And, uh, and so by now, this entire space of crypto is too big and the technology is built from the ground up to be unstoppable and permissionless. So it's a very, very interesting space we're in. Expect these bans, be resilient. I know there are a lot of newcomers that uh, came into cryptocurrencies in the last uh, last uh, bull cycles, the last two in the last year and a half, and uh, they haven't seen this ban on ban behavior. It'll happen. Expect it to happen. It's not a big deal. You just go, okay. And uh, the thing that is a big deal is greater regulatory clarity. Every time we have that, I think that's a huge step up. Wherever it happens, it's great for us. Clarity has always been uh, to the benefit of the entire space. So, um, ah, okay. This topic came up. Uh, so this is the, the maximalism topic. So uh, here's a call for my, my community. Um, please don't be an avalanche maxi. Uh, the, uh, you, the, there is no point in, uh, in getting into, you know, in attacking other chains, et cetera. Um, it's perfectly fine to call out bad behaviors by other people. That's fine. We got to do that. We have to police each other. Otherwise, you end up getting into funny situations. There's no ground rules. Everybody's doing crazy stuff. They're like, there's fraud everywhere, et cetera. We should be able to call out bad behaviors, sure. Um, but there's no point in getting tangled up 
in some kind of a you know you know we are an x killer you know whatever this person this this system is a y killer kind of a system kind of a situation we have to be open-minded kind and scientifically driven that's what got us here we were always open-minded to the possibility of new protocols coming up with valuable ideas every valuable such idea i found i tried to add into avalanche all of the engineers were, who were, were, have been working on Avalanche have been doing the same. I've been trying to, to be incredibly kind to everybody, no matter what their old background might have been. Many other Maxis from other communities have checked out Avalanche and they have loved what they see. We need to provide for them an environment where they feel welcome. And uh, it's incredibly important that as we do this, um, to, to do this as we grow. The space is going to grow enormously. So CZ was saying that there are only about, there are about 400 million people who have crypto accounts. You know, there might be 400 million. That seems like a large number. The right way to view it, and this is what CZ was saying, the right way to view it is there are billions of people out there who have nothing whatsoever. They haven't touched crypto yet. It's not like the internet. So the internet, uh, you know, everybody on the globe has, has an inter has, uses the internet in one fashion or another. So we're not at the saturation, technological saturation point by, by a mile and a half yet. So it's very, very early and we need to be able to absorb those people. And the communities that will absorb people best are not the ones that have their own diet, right? Are they not gonna be the ones where people uh, say funny stuff uh, that's a cliche stuff uh, or hold fringe views. They're gonna be the ones where people are normal they're welcoming reasonable people that you would be proud to invite into your home. And I've been in this space for a long time and uh, many of the people, especially the early ones I've met, are people I'd, I'd keep away from my own personal life and the people I love. So don't be like those people. Let's be, uh, let's be our, like ourselves, which is welcoming, kind, nice. And uh, um, it doesn't mean we need to compromise our technological principles. I think you just heard me talk about the, the shortcomings of, of other protocols. I will do that. That's fair, right? So this is a simple game. They're objective metrics. We, we work so hard to do well on those objective metrics. And when we do, we get to boast. This is the prerogative of a system builder. So, and my, my engineers will be very proud of what they've built. That's normal. They're going to do that. Um, but uh, but no no uh, none of this maxi stuff um, and uh, in the future what's going to happen there will be many coins none of these coins will die and uh, even the most worthless or even the most broken ones don't just disappear they never really die what what really is important here is the growth so the ones that absorb the growth are going to be the ones that are technologically superior so um, and the ones whose communities are welcoming so let's be those and uh, I think people are noticing this. Uh, we just tend to be um, humble. Well, you know, sometimes humble. Sometimes I boast a little bit. During these all-access channels, I think I show you a glimpse of, uh, of, of a little bit more behind the scenes. Um, we are certainly proud people of what we've built, um, but we're also open to the possibility that someday somebody will build something even better. And uh, if we see such a thing, then we will see how we can adopt it into, into Avalanche. And uh, so anyway, so that's, uh, that's where we are. Um, oh, and then the final thing. Something really cool happened, um, the, the Constitution DAO. So a bunch of people got together and uh, they pooled their money to buy a copy of the, one of the 13 copies of the US Constitution. And uh, it was fascinating. And um, I think it was 17,400 people who got together. And uh, quite a lot of money was pooled together, something on the order of 30 to $40 million, I believe. They paid a, a pretty penny in, in fees to Ethereum to do this. And um, they entered an auction and uh, they did not win. And uh, the winner was, was slightly above, the paid slightly above the Constitution DAO. So that brings the question, well, uh, had you not paid the, the high Ethereum fees, you maybe perhaps could have, uh, could, have, uh, could have actually purchased the Constitution. Maybe, maybe. Um, so there is that. Uh, so a more efficient underlying network would have allowed you to 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 do that uh, that thing, uh, or maybe the counter bidder would have found out exactly you know how much was there and just would have bid slightly above that. We don't know the budget of the counter bidder, the person who actually won the bid, won the auction. Um, yeah, there's that, but uh, but there's something more interesting going on here. Um, so yeah, and then there's of course sorry. The second question is, 
the constitution DAO and auctions, the transparency of, of blockchains don't really work well with auctions. To do well at an auction, you have to be able to hold private information. And on a blockchain with the constitution DAO, you're not able to hold your final balance private. And so this effort was kind of doomed from the get-go, I think. So, uh, and then there's, a, there's another thing, which is if, if your final budget is known, then the person selling it will bid you all the way to your max. Imagine a, a constitution DAO that collects a billion dollars. Then uh, I know you're willing, to, willing and ready to pay a billion, then, uh, and I'm selling the constitution myself. I will put in fake unbacked bids all the way to $999 million. Have you bid slightly above me? I lose the auction. I don't have to pay a dime. I ended up forcing you to exhaust your, uh, your entire budget. So this whole thing did not really make sense. Um, but it does show something interesting. A group of people came together to do something in the real world. And, um, and uh, they tried to do something in the real world that has symbolic value. That's nice. They tried to do something that has some ties to our political system. That's beginning to get interesting. Now, there are other things they could do. So Nako ended up pointing out something interesting. Now, imagine what people can do if they were to organize on blockchains to carry out political action. Imagine that, uh, that they, they create super PACs and they start funding uh, politicians. Uh, any kind of campaign finance law you might have, any kind of limit you might have, they will be able to just blow a giant hole right through. Why? Because you know it's on a chain, the donors are anonymous. Suddenly, foreign powers can start uh, start putting money uh, towards uh, towards policy goals that benefit them, and it becomes a really, really messy, really, really strange situation. And um, I'm not really sure what happens next. It's an interesting thing to, thing to contemplate. And uh, the next election in the U.S., um, I, I'll be curious to see how this plays out. So um, that's that. Um, let's see, there are other questions. Okay, so let me, let me, in the last 10 minutes, let me try to handle quick questions, as many as I can. So uh, do you think it's possible to create decentralized gaming on Avalanche? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I'm looking a little tired and my voice is cracked. Why? Because we are working uh, just about every angle to get new, new use cases on Avalanche and, uh, and uh, building gaming specific subnets is certainly one of the most exciting areas uh, that I can imagine. So um, I don't believe in blockchains that are specific to a single use. Avalanche is not. It does everything and it does everything incredibly well. And the way it's, oh, it, it does this is it has this notion of subnets. You can create a subnet under Avalanche that is specific to a particular use. So you don't necessarily have to clog up the main network. And um, subnet capabilities exist today, uh, but they're going to be expanded sometime soon. And I'm really, really excited and looking forward to what is to come. And we want to create uh, subnets for gaming that are powered by uh, independently issued coins that allow other people to create game economies on top of us. Okay, so there's, these are the leftover questions from, uh, from, uh, from last week. Uh, can Avalanche scale to millions of validators with a small finality delay, given the log n scaling of the consensus algorithm? Absolutely. That is the exact uh, uh, design point of, um, of Avalanche. That's exactly the unique differentiator. The other folks in this space uh, scale with n squared, and Avalanche ends up taking log n uh, time proportional to log n. So bring it on. You go from a million to, t to 10 million you know, the, the time to finality increases by only a small relative margin. Um, so second question, this is an interesting one. Do you plan on lowering the threshold to become a validator now that Avox price has increased considerably? Um, I don't plan on doing anything. It's a decentralized network. So, um, uh, so, so there is that. Uh, what we do want to do, I think, as a community and as, as the devs behind the software is give you the tools to, to coordinate these things on chain. That's called governance. And when we have the governance mechanism in place, we'll be able to collectively make decisions to raise these or lower these uh, financial parameters. What are the financial parameters of importance? The minimum stake required, the minimum staking period, maximum staking period, uh, staking reward rate, and a whole bunch of other things. Reward rates might change, 
the number of uh, of ox to be issued is hard capped. That is not going to, going to change. But the speed with which you approach the hard cap, you can speed up or slow down um, depending on external circumstances. So that should all be governed by, by governance. That should all be governed by all of our votes. There is no single person in charge. Um, now, as we vote on these things in the future, we need to keep one thing uh, in mind, which is these, these parameters incentivize certain behaviors and, um, and we need to, to use them carefully. So you can easily set something to a level that is, uh, that is bad um, and uh, end up clogging up the network or end up taking the network into a situation that is undesirable. So for example, if you reduce the, uh, the stake required to zero, let's say, then, then uh, people can attack the system trivially. So, you know, because there's no cost, right? So you can create as many nodes as you like, and then suddenly your consensus is, that is, is, is going to be completely invalidated. So clearly, um, we, need to, we need to be a little bit careful. You can't just willy-nilly take a system. You know, it's kind of like a plane. There is a flight envelope, and uh, you can take it to a different portion of the flight envelope, and you need to approach it carefully. So um, the governance module will have safeguards in it, uh, but we as a community need to be diligent. We need to discuss these things. Um, I think if you're not already a member of the Avax uh, subreddit on, on Reddit, you should be there. And um, uh, so that's where we should discuss these things before we, uh, we, uh, we enact these, uh, you know, before we go on chain and vote. And uh, the governance module is coming. It's, 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 uh, well, it's, it's, I think, very close to completion. And... Uh, uh, there are some other issues uh, that we need to consider before we enable, like non-technical issues we need to consider before we enable governance, but uh, like legal issues we need to consider. But um, bottom line, we, this is a collective decision uh, with governance, uh, and we do need to be, I want to attune you to, to, being, uh, to, to, to thinking deeply about these parameter changes. It's not as simple as, hey, let's like lower it. You got to be like, well, okay, I want to lower it, but what's the speed with which I lower it? And what's a, what's a reasonable value? So we know the system is working beautifully where it is. Well, um, where do we want to take it and, and, and how fast? Um, so will you revise the fee range once again? No, I want to revise the fee range. Uh, the fee range is, is fine. Uh, everything, every, all parameter changes should be done via governance. Um, changes we make that make the system used more should happen in tandem with optimizations. So we know the system is at a fine point right now. If you speed everything up uh, by 2x, then you can lower fees and increase the load by 2x. That's fine, right? So, but if you don't do that and you just lower fees to, let's say, zero, then you'll have a clogged network and you will have a whole lot of people who are upset. So again, um, there has to be some thinking done here and it has to be a carefully coordinated, community voted, a uh, set of changes, and we have to be careful about about how um, about not taking the system out of the the safe flight envelope too too quickly. Um, so uh, uh, let's see how. So I can't understand this. The question number three, quite on the fly here. How do you plan to solve the growing state issue? Oh, the growing state issue. This is the bane of my existence. Not not the issue itself, but the phrase. So. Uh, I kept hearing from Ethereum people, hey, you know, you can't make Geth go any faster than it does because the problem is with growing state. And, uh, and so, uh, so that's, that was like they started grinding away at us even before we launched. And they kept repeating this talking point. It's just the growing, the state growth is the problem. State growth is the problem. You can't scale Geth by doing consensus faster, da, da, da. And I think we've shown the world that that was wrong, that there are many bottlenecks and um, the consensus bottleneck in, uh, in uh, proof of work coins like Ethereum is very real. I'm not even talking about the, the environmental concerns. I'm talking about it's, they're, just, they're just slow to make decisions. And, uh, and changing that is a huge step up. And it's not just the TPS we're talking about, remember, because uh, we're talking about speed. And, um, and we showed the world that you can build a much, much, much faster blockchain. Growth is a, is a concern, and there are many techniques one can apply for handling state growth. And uh, behind the scenes, we've been working on, on uh, some of these. 
and uh, I'm excited about what is to come in the next next couple of months. And instead of battling it out, instead of telling people what can be done, we'll just show the world. I think that's easier. That's what I've learned. It's just to go out into the market and say, hey, this is what we built. And if it stands on its own, it stands on its own. And we have a track record of delivering things that are scientifically backed and stand on their own pretty good. Um, so uh, uh, let's see. Let me see. With thousands of subnets, will the main net acting as a bridge be the weak link so that even though each subnet allows for thousands of TPS, inter-subnet communication will still be limited by the mainnet performance? That's a good question. So the P-chain is the coordination chain, the platform chain. And um, uh, it can be a bottleneck, but uh, for that to be a bottleneck, then there must be so much inter-subnet inter communication, inter-chain communication, that... Uh, that somehow the, the default network is, is, uh, is, uh, is bottleneck. Even then, the sum total aggregate capacity of the system will be quite large, right? So um, take, the, the, take the universe as it is now, a single chain, let's say Ethereum. And now, instead of Ethereum, now you have our structure, a P chain where the coordination happens, a C chain where Ethereum activities take place, and maybe a C2 chain, a C3 chain, a C2 chain for NFTs, a C3 chain for gaming, a C4 chain for other smart contracts, and an X2 chain for different kinds of digital assets, IOTA, I mean, IoT chain, etc. So now you have a gazillion different chains, a very, very high capacity network, and uh, yeah, they might actually be um, limited by mainnet performance when that happens. Um, most of your transactions will be local. We know this from databases. We know this from looking at uh, digital forensics on blockchains. So uh, by the time the, the P chain is bottlenecked, you probably have thousands to tens, maybe hundreds of thousands, the, uh, the capacity of, uh, of today's chains uh, happening some in, in aggregate in your system. So, uh, so yes, this is, it's a, could be a bottleneck. I cannot wait to face that bottleneck. There are techniques we can then use because even when you have the P chain acting as a bottleneck, remember that these cross chain communications are, are between one chain and another, and they too can happen concurrently with each other. So, uh, so our current P chain is a totally ordered chain. It, it makes sure that everything is sequenced. Um, but, uh, but remember, if somebody is trying to go from C2 to C3 and another person is trying to go from IoT to X, so those two activities can happen in parallel and without coordination with each other. So there are lots of techniques in our back pocket that we know to bring to, this, to, to bear on this problem. And so I'm not the least bit worried. I cannot wait to face it. And uh, like all of the scalability and technological problems we've faced until now, and, uh, and, and resolved with uh, the latest, greatest technology, with groundbreaking, novel, uh, new tricks that nobody had even conceived of, I'm sure that we'll be able to handle these, uh, these problems. The, there are no, as far as I can tell, there are no uh, impossibility proofs or impossibility results standing in the way of scaling to the size of the planet and, and to the size of the many different use cases that await us in the blockchain space. So um, I think I'm going to stop there. Uh, thank you for bearing with me. It's just a brain dump of various different questions and ideas. Uh, what I think I will do for, oh, I don't know what I will do for next week because it's Thanksgiving, but, uh, uh, but uh, the week after I might want to bring a, uh, a visitor to the show or to the podcast and talk to you about, uh, about their, their unique vantage point. So uh, thanks again for, um, for bearing with me. And uh, have a wonderful weekend. I'm going to go and uh, have some tea and uh, look at uh, system metrics for Avalanche and uh, maybe write a thread about other um, measurement techniques, especially about scalability for blockchains. Thank you all very much. Have a great day.